All right. Um, listen, um, greatly appreciate you guys joining us. Um, you know, this morning, uh, as I said, I think we've got in excess of 100 years worth of end user computing experience uh, on this call. And you all work for either Acetrix, VMware, VDI, Desktop as a Service, iGel, uh, Value Added Partner, Reseller, um, either in Belgium, uh, the UK, or, or up in the Nordics. And I know that uh, all of your organizations are, are very highly respected as I know that all of you on this call are very highly respected and well-known in the industry. So I thank you for joining this morning's panel. Um, what we really wanted to do was to try and pull sort of some brains together and just discuss what we've been seeing for the last six months and what the future might look like. But um, maybe Adam, if it's all right with you, we can start by your view on where we are at with work from home versus the future of work? I think the reality is it's still a bit of a mixed bag. I think that we're, we're heading into the era of the remote ready workforce more than anything else. Um, I think that um, there's absolutely going to be a headier blend, a headier mix of people working from home either on a permanent basis or occasionally um, but um, probably coming from the element of people, organizations trying to protect their cultures more than anything else. And that's where they're really concerned about how, how much will this new working style disrupt them as their cultural values and, and how they operate as an organization. Their I think that's the thing that people are trying to protect. And that's why actually, if you had a 80-20 split before, you might have something that looks a little bit more like 70-30 or 60-40 moving forward. So it's really about protecting culture. Yeah. Peter, what, what about you? I think there's, um, yeah, I, I agree to Adam's comment. There's a lot to say about culture of offices um, that, you know, the, the, that's going to be a, a big thing and a big reason why people won't be so, um, you know, uh, revolutionary about how they change what they do going forward. Um, but I think there will be a, a shift change and everyone is, is reviewing what they do. Um, everyone is having an, a different approach now. And um, what, we're, what we're sort of seeing a development of is how can we make sure that what the user does in the office and what they experience in the office has to be exactly the same as what they do at home. So that consistent user experience has to be the same wherever they are. One customer we're working with, they've got this, uh, idea that they're going to come up with a package that they give each of their staff. So when they're in the office, they've got a, a desktop thin client and the experience they're used to, but they'll get given a package that gives them all the configuration they need, headset, mouse, keyboard, etc. But also they're supplying them with like a UD pocket eye gel. So they can plug that into whatever computer is at home. Mm -hmm. And then they have that consistent user experience. Yeah. Excellent. Michael, you mentioned to me last week, Operation Cleanup. Yeah, we're, we're seeing a lot of different things. Uh, we see that when we were working in the office before, that was our platform. Mm -hmm. uh, when we are working remotely, we need a platform, not just applications or VDIs or things like that. We need a platform, some things to make it because when I needed something, I went to Peter or I went to Lisa or I went to the guy that I needed the information of. Now I can't do that. Now I need a platform to make that happen. So, so that's a new thing. Does, does that include, uh, and I apologize if I'm misunderstanding exactly what you're saying, there, does that include service management platforms as well, do you think then? <clears throat> yeah, I, I think it's a collaboration of everything because... We, we can perform, even if we can provide the same applications that we used to provide our workers when they were in the office. Mm. Those applications don't do the whole work when we send the people home. Mm. They need a, another thing. They need a new system, a new platform to interact with each other. Yeah. Um, I mean, these events that are now digital, they are nice, they are, they are working. But it's not the same as when we mingle in the evening after the event and when we talk 
stories about we, we don't get that interaction between yeah. people anymore and that's a challenge for us we, we need to make this happen um Dita can I come to you quickly um we had a conversation last week about pre-covid and about how there were some questions in your mind about the future of VDI and desktop as a service um and then you've sort of seen COVID come along and, and seen how that view might, might well have changed. Can you talk to that a bit? Yeah, so, so that was actually um, one of the things that, that were uh, a little bit uh, surprising to me, like uh, end of 2019, when um, everybody was, uh, we do a lot of, of uh, VDI projects and SVC projects, but um, a lot of our customers, uh, they told us that like, for example, we will phase out Citrix in the next uh, couple of years um, because we will go to a more uh, distributed system, Windows 10, standalone machines, uh, modern managed and so on. What we saw um, at our customers is that the moment that uh, the COVID uh, breakout uh, happened and everybody had to work from home, they all fell back to the Citrix platform and the uh, even even very old platforms that had like I don't know, 10% of the users still on it uh, that were not yet migrated to something else. All of a sudden, the, the capacity had to be doubled, tripled uh, just to, to cope with the, um, yeah, with the work from home and what, you, what was said before, the uh, user experience. Mm -hmm. It had to be consistent. It had to be uh, as good as when they were in the office. Good, good. Kyle, what have you seen? I think it's this, the same as what the guys have been saying around um, taking back control is at the forefront of a lot of enterprise IT admins' minds at the moment. They've let people run wild a little bit with regards to just getting services delivered. Um, there's been lots of people using things like WhatsApp and maybe typically untrusted ways of communicating, collaborating, um, and now they need to provide a service that's just as good, if not better, than what they've been using during this pandemic. Um, otherwise, they're going to not adopt them and carry on using the services they have been using during this, this situation. This concept of all the red tape that we go through as is, um, service providers and resellers, right, with customers to get projects off the ground and delivered, basically got thrown out the window and was told us just get on with it. We need it running. We need to deliver service to our end users, our customers, our, our, um, our care workers, whoever it might be in, in the community. And Touching on the point of um, the likes of Citrix and VMware and, and WVD and things, um, we did have quite a few customers look at deploying WVD and getting that up and running for certain use cases. And we had uh, examples of um, healthcare customers that um, were implementing an on-premise um, GPU-enabled virtual desktop for radiology users. And then obviously the pandemic hit supply chain challenges, people on site challenges, and people wanting to put their engineers on site for various um, concerns and risks. So they ended up putting it on um, Microsoft Azure or even AWS on NVIDIA backed um, instances, running the Citrix overlay service in this example mm -hmm. to provide that user experience and using the um, WVD underlay to provide multi-user Windows 10 and things as well. I think the, the, the concept for me was at the beginning just, just get things done. Mm -hmm. And now it's yeah. around, well, now we've got things done and, and everyone's working again. How do I take back control? How do I secure it? How do I get governance? How do I now build my foreseeable strategy and plan to deliver what I've just delivered in a more controlled manner? It's quite amazing what IT and organizations have achieved in such a, yeah. such a short space of time. I mean what we used to spend years and millions of dollars forming projects, piloting them, trying to roll them out. And in many cases, organizations have been incredibly successful apart from obviously supply chain issues and hardware shortages of, of actually enabling those things overnight. Uh, that's interesting uh, what you said earlier about uh, the culture thing also. So there was more like uh, before COVID, there was more uh, like, tendency to, to work from home more than the allowed time. While now we see that everybody is forced to work from home, people are really asking to go back to the office, not to work, but to see each other again and to, to hang around and to, to, to have the social, uh, the social um, contact with each other. And even, even uh, 
in our company, we also have people that are living in a small apartment that they, they go crazy because they <laughs> sit by themselves uh, at home and, and they, they need that human contact. And that's uh, besides the technology, that's one of the most important uh, things, I think. Yeah. And there's a, the, the, there's a, um, a statistic and a quote by uh, Nicholas Boothman, I think it is. Most of the con communication and rapport building is done by non-spoken language and gestures and body language and posture and emotion and empathy and all those. And they're things you can't do with these things, right? They just, yeah. it removes that social interaction. So building relationships or, or meaningful relationships with customers and coworkers and everyone else, it's, it's very difficult. I've hired members of staff during this, this, this pandemic. And for as much as it's going great and we're all doing well, it's not the same as meeting face to face and getting them on board and bringing them on the journey of for us working for CBW. You know, I think in, uh, at this particular moment in time, um, you can't over communicate. You know, there are, you know, I'm, I'm lucky, I'm locked in here with my family. Most of the time, that's a great thing. Uh, but, you know, there's plenty of people in my direct team across our organisation, across all of our organisations that are, you know, just starting out in their, in their working life. They've got a one bed apartment and they've been locked, locked in by themselves for months and months and months. And it's not good for them. And, and I think what I what we've specifically learned from this is that, there are some, you can't just say an entire company is a good fit for working from home or an entire company is a good fit for working from the office or an entire company is a good fit for working on VDI or, or anything else. You, you start to really empathize with the individuals. I've seen inside, this sounds weird, I've seen inside lots of people's bedrooms, you know, I've mm. seen inside lots of people's living rooms, I've sat in lots of people's gardens and I'm more, in, I've, I've met lots of people's children and weird, you know, cats that run across the screen and dogs that won't start barking or start eating the computer. Um, I've seen all these things and I've been introduced into the people's lives and I think empathy is one of the greatest things that has come out of this. I, I am more empathetic to the individual, but when we think about change, when we think about transition, sometimes, almost all times in my opinion, we talk about this business change. But the reality is that change starts with the individual. Change starts with one or two people having an idea. And I think that we need to pay more attention to our people. We need to be more empathetic. We need to understand what's getting in the way of their work-life balance, not just what's going to make them more efficient at work. And we need to give them the tools that enable it. Interesting point you make there. I was talking to uh, Spana Health on the customer panel this morning, and what they said was they were able, thanks to VDI, uh, they've actually got a VMware platform, they were able to obviously enable work from home fairly quickly. What they found is, is that the hardware and the endpoint and the infrastructure they had inside the hospital didn't necessarily have cameras and headsets attached to it. And so what they found was that people had become so used to using unified comms when they were at home that they were then trying to yeah. um, spark up the same level of interaction and meetings when they were in the office. Yeah. But it's not just the users either. It's that it's the, you, you've got to be careful about the po creating a poison chance for yourself type of thing. You know, ITF proved they can deliver a service at a level that in a lot of situations, I know we're talking about control is something we need to regain, but the experience that some of these uh, remote session, uh, remote deployments have achieved is far superior to those on premise. And actually, you know, that's not an isolated example. We've got quite a lot of organizations that are quite concerned about, well, we're not going to be able to give such a rich collaboration platform when we get back to the office because we just don't have the kit. We just don't have networking. We just don't have the space, you know, whereas people being able to use their own gadgets and gizmos has, has really enriched the ability for people to be productive. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You talk about control. Um, yeah. Peter, what are you seeing from a security point of view? The, the, the shift has really sort of, um, to, to the cloud was, was opening people's, uh, eyes as to what the vulnerabilities were anyway um, but this has completely changed um, the, you know it's it's moved everyone's kind of uh, understanding and you know now now it's kind of it, what do we do uh, to really say is it is it really just about the end point no it's not just about the end point it's about uh, the 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 network that, that is supporting the end point and it's it's you know the traffic in between and and the the user's uh, habits uh, where the user is located you know um are there people within that household that could see that data 
on your screen uh, and take it away. You know, there, there's so many different variables that you've got to take into consideration that you never had to consider before. Mm-hmm. That it's now opened up a, a, a whole different ether of of problems uh, and areas to consider, and it's it's overcoming those challenges and those battles. I think that the general theme was is that it was again it was a wake up call that security needs to be where your people are, whereas historically it's just been wedded to where you thought they worked. Um, but it is it is the same thing. It is in layers. It's multifaceted. It is about the policies and the procedures not just the technology essentially it comes down to the the design principle if it's not secure then nobody cares how resilient it is how much it costs yeah. how performant it is it's it's a it's a it's a red light green light question really yeah i'm very conscious of time and um i know i could carry on talking for another three hours but um um what about the future then um the question I'm going to ask you all is if you were to write a tweet um, to sort of summarize what the next six to 12 months needs to consider or might be focused on, what would that tweet uh, look like? So, um, Kyle, I'll start with you if that's okay. Yeah, sure. Um, Nothing like a bit of prep. (laughs) (laughs) Um, I I think for me, it'd like take stock, evaluate, understand where you're at and, plan forward would be my tweet understand where you are and plan forward excellent okay um dita i would say the contextual security thing is uh, looking to security technologies that uh, can be enabled across all platforms and not really on a single vendor and use that to secure all your workspaces and not case by case very good michael we need to see how people really add value to their businesses, regardless of what and when, uh, and then add technology to that. Uh, and uh, understand that that process has been changed with the new normal. Interesting. Okay. Uh, Adam? I think the next 12 months we'll see um, this, this concept of the remote ready workforce really bed in, i.e. you will plan for it whether you think your individuals are going to work remotely or not. There will be a huge amount of scrutiny over every penny that's spent and there'll be a lot more focus on visualising that data. Um, and then I think we'll do all of that at the same time as scrambling to innovate and integrate and automate. <laughs> Peter. I heard a really good um, quote from uh, Baskaya from uh, Dell, who said, you shouldn't ever talk about strategy if your operations aren't working. And don't talk about operations if your strategy isn't working. <laughs> and I think that's, that's very relevant because um, actually, you know, it, they, they've got to be combined, um, what your strategy and what your operational focus in. But actually... I'd say my my tweet would be all around not focusing on operations and really come into what the core value of your business is about. Um, and that includes everything we've discussed today. And if you haven't got your uh, the, the whole business buy-in, including all of your end users being able to work collaboratively and enjoy coming to work, be that remote or in an office, you know, forget it you know you're not going to be able to achieve what you want so you know forget operations it would be my uh, tweet it's concentrate on outcome yeah yeah excellent gentlemen i have thoroughly enjoyed today's conversation i know we've um i know we've overrun somewhat um and i know many uh, of the people that are watching this will probably have a whole host of additional questions and topics they would love to get your inputs on but um obviously you know whether um it's Dita uh, at Nimble, Carl at CDW, Michael at Atea, Adam at Softcat or Peter at Bytes um you can get hold I'm sure any of these chaps would uh, welcome the uh, the ability to continue the, these conversations uh, onwards Thank you all very much for taking the time to talk to me before this panel and during this panel. Thanks for attending uh, Digital Disrupt in EMEA. Um, Long may our working relationships continue. I've known 
quite a few of you now for, for many, many years. And uh, I hold all of you in very, very high regard. So I thank you for your time.